Hey, this is Eric Lopez, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Marie Claire, D, 3, 4. Initiate, part 2. Okay, okay, all right, let's go. <laughs> let's go, I'm gonna have to play catch up in my head. Let's just keep diving in. Okay, so Jason, and Jason was the son of Hera? Is that what you said? No, Jason was just the son of um, a king, or a queen, who had had a different son that was of a god and he, he basically Jason felt- was entirely normal Jason was the Batman in this he was no, like Jason the totally is the Robin wait okay what okay go ahead what now right Jason is the Robin especially the Robin in, oh because they're all demigods season. yeah because oh, this is these I are all demigods oh I see what you're saying Okay, yeah. okay, okay. I'm I'm caught up. I'm caught up. <laughs> it's not a direct parallel because it's a very different story. I'm literally right? building new neural pathways while I'm listening to you. I'm so, so sorry. Give me No, <laughs> why are you sorry? The more the better. Uh well, maybe not, but kind of. All right. So Jason is the Dick Grayson yeah. of the Argonauts, which was the first Teen Titans. Okay. Yes. Definitely redefining how I'm looking at a lot of things right now. <laughs> okay, so the art. So they're going after the Golden Fleece, and the Golden Fleece. Uh, what do I know about the Golden Fleece? Yeah, the golden, what do you know? The, gold, the Golden Fleece was this golden sheepskin that gave invulnerability. Is that right? Um, no. It it sort of blessed the land. It blessed the land. Oh, I thought if you wore it, it gave you like regenerative powers. Maybe I read that in a comic somewhere. I don't know. I mean. It's kind of a MacGuffin <laughs> in that, like, you know, like. <laughs> it has, it has p- plot powers, whatever the plot yeah, is. Yeah, like, like it's, it's really, the Oracle says, hey, Jason, everything will work out if you go and get it. Oh, okay, that's nice. Right? Right. So you have to go get it to prove your worth. Okay. Right? Was that the only thing that they went to go get? Yeah, but they had to sail across the ocean. And, and they had to you know, do fight monsters and stuff on the way. Yeah, kind of and they okay. and they ended up getting distracted by uh, the Isle of Women. I mean, I guess you know, <laughs> like they end up getting stuck there because the women um, don't have any men to reproduce with. That story arc is so strange to me. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. sorry, sorry, Amazons of Themyscira. Uh, anyway, <laughs> no, it's it's not um, it's not Themyscira. No, no, I was saying like the the story arc of the all women island or all women whatever, right? That that are just waiting, waiting, waiting for some men to show up. Just well, up, seriously, the the women on that island were actually cursed to smell bad, and so the men left to go Jeez. get new wives. It's a little weird. I mean, like most Greece, Greek myth, we were we, we 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 were just talking about the stories of the time, so. Yeah, and and much about much about the Argo is the journey, right? Like that's mm-hmm. it's about them, you know, coming back from getting the golden fleece. They get it almost immediately and then they have to get their way back. And one of the things oh, that always sort of strikes me as a little weird about that whole story is when so the person that helps Jason retrieve the golden fleece is actually a woman named Medea. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. And she she falls in love with Jason and ends up kind of helping him trick the uh dragon to allow Jason to take the fleece and for them to actually be successful in their whole plot. Okay. Medea actually ends up killing her brother or getting her brother killed. Okay. And sacrificing him basically because he was on the opposite side and she ends up like kind of joining Jason in his journey, which is really interesting. That sounds messed up. (laughs) 
So when you say interesting, what do you mean by interesting? I, I just find it really interesting from a narrative perspective that she chose sides against her own family, her against her own blood, right? Okay. Yeah. And and that parallels Mish Martian's choice in the show. That's what I was just thinking. Yeah, that's what I was starting to think. And I'm thinking like, well, what may or may not happen in a third or fourth season, particularly if we start getting the Martians involved. Mm-hmm. Uh, because... Isn't it called Outsiders? It is called Outsiders. There's, a, there's several reasons that that could be named that way, including the comic that was Batman and the Outsiders. But I was just thinking like, but everything is multi-layered with Greg and Brandon. So mm-hmm. I'm sure it means like 12 things that we'll figure out eventually. But this idea that in the comics, the Martians are all dead. They were genocided. Um, so in the, in the show, the Martians are still an active live civilization that has potential interactions with Earth, which is fascinating to me. So what if there's a problem? Like, what if there's a, you know, white Martian uprising? I think that she's going to choose her, her Earth family, I think. I, I, would, I would think so, too. Yeah. But she has a white Martian, like a, one of her brothers is a white Martian brother. And that could tie to this whole idea that she ends up sacrificing that brother. And, oh, you're and then, me now. and then, uh, well, like Medea does, right? Medea right, ends up, and then she ends yes. up becoming the queen of the land that Jason is from and ends up marrying Jason. And they have like 14 kids. And yeah. <laughs> No one in the podcast world can see my face right now. It's just, it's these parallels and these stories. I mean, like, there's, the Star Wars will say there's only one story, <laughs> right? You'll right. hear Kathleen Kennedy talk about it, George. It's all, they all tell the same story. And in many ways, the stories that we tell our youth all have to boil down to, hey, how did you work out this problem? How did you work out this us versus them complication that you have? Or, you know, going from your old family to the family that you have made. And that's right. very much what Miss Martian is going to go through, right? So so let's talk about this for a minute. You know, barring, sure. you know, when we'll get Greg on the show to actually <laughs> talk about some of this stuff. Let's talk about the narrative aspect of the use of these. Like there's, you already mm. mentioned the Percy Jackson. Mm-hmm series right there's you know american gods the tv show and novel right neil gaiman mm-hmm. sandman also neil gaiman a uh, book that i love called coyote blue like there are these literal these are all very literal interpretations of pantheons or mythologies uh coming to life or manifesting in some anthropomorphic way in at least in all those cases of the modern world but aside from these kind of more literal takes on a, a pantheon or even superheroes, which are fairly literal take on this, yeah, these stories are, I guess I wouldn't be surprised if Greg was like, yeah, basically Miss Martian's story is this meta, me, me, well, meta narrative of Medea, right? Oh, yeah. This, like, well, her, I, her, I mean, her, I don't know. Like there's lots of, there's lots of stories out there that end up having, you know, these journeys. That's what I'm saying. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if Greg said, like, oh, no, they were, we definitely had that in our head, right? That's why we gave her one white Martian brother, right? There could be some <laughs> reason, you know, love you, Greg. Uh, maybe he didn't think about this at all, but he's going to get credit for it anyway. But the this idea, but but is there a way to take that? If you're a creator and you want to take this and put this into whatever your creative thing is, do you yeah. feel like this myth- mythological tie-in, this more this non-subtle direct mythological tie-in is maybe overused or is it still inspirational in many ways or are there more subtle ways to fold that? What if you're talking about using these kinds of stories inspired by these characters but are not in a superhero setting, that are not in that are just people going through their everyday lives, right? Yeah, like like um more realistic I think I think we see this comparison the best between Star Trek and Star Wars. Okay, I'm all right, right? I'm interested. Okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so Star Wars is uh science fantasy and right. Star Trek is science fiction. And the okay. difference between the two is it, you know, is Star Wars is it doesn't really matter how fast you got there. 
how fast light speed was, whether you can breathe on the planet that you get to, whether the food that you eat on that brand new planet will poison you. It, that stuff doesn't matter because what you're telling is the myth. Star Trek is about the human in the other. The truth, okay. the realism of the experience in the other. So telling today's stories put into extreme circumstances yes. to tell us something about ourselves today. Whereas Star Wars is about telling sort of past stories or these extreme amped up versions of fantasy to tell us about ourselves today. <laughs> it's just it's just different ways to get to the same thing. Yeah, I was going to say, I stopped myself, but I was going to say one is external cultural and one's internal but that's not necessarily the case at all but i always think of like the cla there's classics you know star trek the original series story where there's a you know this species of people on a planet and they're at war because one of them has you know is 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 the the right side of their face is black and their white side the the left side of their face is white but the other people on the planet it's the opposite the left mm -hmm. side of their face is black and the right side is white. And it, it's just this extremity. So does it like, is it hard science fiction? No, not in any way. But I understand what you're saying about this idea of the science, the science of it. It wants to be grounded in some verisimilitude, something mm -hmm. to allow you to hold on to what this reality is, right? They bother to at least make an explanation for warp drive. Mm -hmm. where nobody cares what a hydrospanner does in Star Wars. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, we got, we all have our own interpretation of what a hydrospanner is, but the hydrospanner isn't the point. You know, Star Trek has a Heisenberg compensator. Okay, well, that's a crazy piece of technology that cannot possibly exist, but at least someone put in the idea that there's a Heisenberg, you know, uncertainty principle that we should probably compensate for if we're going to be transporting people across space. At least somebody put a thought into it. So you're like, okay, well, I can hand wave that because at least you you're put You're going to go to a it. planet on Star Trek and they're going to check whether you can breathe on it. Right, right. And and. <laughs> And in superhero stories too, this this drives me crazy. Where people are like, "Oh, why are you questioning?" Okay, okay. So I have a pet peeve that's come up once or twice in the show. But I have a pet peeve as a medical professional when anybody shocks a flat line on a TV show. It drives me insane. If someone's heart is not running, there is no electricity going through your heart, and you shock them, it is not going to start their heart again. We are not cars. This is not how our bodies work. <laughs> so it drives me. It drives me uh, a little bit uh, bonkers when this happens. When mm -hmm. I bring it up, people are like, oh, this is a TV show about superheroes or this is a TV show about whatever. Why do you care if somebody can fly through the air? Why do you care if shocking a flatline doesn't matter or not? Or why, why does it matter? And I'm like, because the only reason why we look at, if you're changing the fundamental function of how a normal human body works, then something is weird. Like something is weird about the world that keeps me ungrounded in believing anything else that's happening mm -hmm. because you haven't bothered to give me the drama of the line between human and superhuman. Yeah. Right. And that's a that's a challenge that Young Justice um, must subscribe to because it's in it's in an Earth like world. Right. So it has to be Earth like enough that it it subscribes to its own rules. So a lot of people in. The Last Jedi had problems with the bombers that attacked the Dreadnought because they're like, how does that work even? And they like, they lost their minds in a world where literally there's laser swords and the force. Yeah, but, exactly. And, and because you know? in, in the movie, they didn't explain it. But in the tie-in books, or in one of the other books, they talked about them being mag mines. Yeah. Like they're being, ma they're mag bombs. So they were actually magnetically attracted to the object they were being dropped toward. Which I get. So now you have a you have a spaceship that's in atmosphere that can literally drop bombs or out of atmosphere, and and if there's no gravity well affecting it, then can be magnetically. I, that's yep. fine, but they didn't explain it in the movie. I, I had some other issues with movie. it too, and it did because they were yeah. like, wait, if they had just named them like mag bombs, right? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't take that much, but it was it was a little something that kind of threw people threw people off. And if you have one or two of these in a movie. I, I'm not. I'm not too scared. I'm like, okay, that's fine. 
It, it's yeah. all good. You know, I'm just going to go with it. But if you have a whole bunch of them, then I start being like, I can't trust anything you're telling me now. Like, I don't understand why I'm watching this. Did you do, and from a writer's perspective, I'm like, did you do another draft? <laughs> like, is this like the third draft instead of the 20th? Like it probably should have been, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. did you, did you give it to a reader's room and have them try and break the script and ask questions or, or were you the only person writing this script and then directing the movie or, or writing the script and the director trusted you, whatever it happened to be. And nobody bothered to check to see if anything actually made sense or if it could be just tightened up and made better. You know, that that drives me crazy. Cause to me that, that, that uh, gets across this idea of it's just it feels sloppy right mm. now everybody makes mistakes and everybody er, that that all happens and you can kind of like i don't know you got to write what you got to write and when you're done you're done you could edit something to death you have to decide when you're going to draw the line to be done but there are definitely some things that seem really obvious sometimes where you're like wait you told me x but then later in the movie you did y you mm -hmm. literally tried to surprise me by lying to me at the beginning of the movie, establishing a reality that this happened, that this happened, the, the Ant-Man movie. I love the Ant-Man movie. It's so fun, but it's got this one giant plot hole in it that drives me crazy, which is at the beginning of the movie, they talk about how Scott like shrinks down and keeps his mass. <laughs> and then somehow Hank Pym is carrying a tank on his keychain. <laughs> that's really like, heavy. That's <laughs> wait a minute. Like, it's funny, I get it, it's hilarious, I like it, but also, you literally lied to me at the beginning of the movie. And that's where, that's where, like, this border between, you know, science and this, like, fantasy are there. Like, when they amp up the force, people stop questioning the science in Star Wars, whereas they have a limit to that in Young Justice because of the world that they are saying this world is part of. Yes, and if right. you don't, there, there's a there's a truism, and I can never remember who said this. The idea that the difference between fantasy and reality is that fantasy has to make sense. Yeah. So if you're going to say something and it is bonkers, even though it really happened to you, an editor is not going to let it pass. You could say like, no, this really happened. They're like, yes, but no one's going to believe this. <laughs> And if it, you can set it up in a way that surprises people and they go, oh, wow, that's interesting. But if you just drop something in, it's going to feel like you're not paying attention to plot or building or scaffolding story or presenting something in a, in a particular way. And, you know, I found it interesting earlier, you know, talking about the different ways that stories are told and the monomyth, this idea that the Argonauts went out for the Golden Fleece and they're like, yeah, we found it early. And it's like, ooh, well, that's definitely not really the monomyth pattern. You know what I mean? Well, no, it I mean, they found it, but they had to go through this journey to get there. And it is it is the goal, but in all of their pieces, it's the journey that was more important than right. what they ended up bringing back with them. Right. The Mac the MacGuffin is often not the thing, right? Mm -hmm. and like like Here's another thing, like movie I absolutely love, Indiana Jones. The movie's like amazing. Nothing Indy did, the whole movie mattered, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so if you look at these big things like, okay, the tank on the keychain, okay, it was, it was one thing, it was really funny, I'll give you a pass on that. Indy, credible film, love it. You should have just given the Nazis the thing and it would have killed them all anyway. Uh, okay, but <laughs> it, it, I'm, I'm giving you a hand wave on that. Like, because there's something else to be told. And again, like, if you are telling, if, if you are making these things and these myths and these stories that you're getting across and you're doing it and, and these holes come up five, six, seven times, you start to lose the grounding of the, of the, of the create of the person who's enjoying it, whether it's a reader or watcher or whatever it happens to be. So grounding in this reality is important. And I think that's what's in, though it's interesting, uh, makes almost the demigod stories more interesting than the God mm -hmm. stories is because the demigod has to, in some way, deal with what's happening. Like, so the, the Hercules and his, you know, 12, what are the trials? Is that what they called them? Yeah. There's a word they use. The 12 trials of Hercules. Okay, is he going to do them? Yeah, you, you're pretty confident he's going to do them. But there's like a social and like psychological aftermath he leaves behind him <laughs> as he's every, doing this. Every single one actually costs him a fair amount as he right. goes through them. Yeah. Right, where where Zeus doesn't care. Like, he just like, yeah, okay, whatever. I'm shape-changing into a bull, and I'm going to 
turn someone into a tree and then I'm going back to Olympus, right? There isn't, they don't care as much about it. It's not, there's no consequence to their actions. They don't have to live in the world they're making. Yeah, exactly. And I think that the reality, the realism allows it to be easily permeable for the subconscious to pick up on it, right? I love this quote by uh, Joseph Campbell, which is, the function of mythology is showing everything as metaphor to transcendence. And that's yes. what the entire show of Young Justice is all about, is about how do we become who we are meant to be through these trials that we have to go through and yet still retain who we ought to be. And it's who they think they should be in the beginning all the way through to who they end up actually being. And I mean, Joseph Campbell would say it's following your bliss, right? So it's right. following what you love. Right. Okay, that seems like so obvious to me now that you said it. But <laughs> like this idea of they all, all of them had a vision of who they were supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But when they get to the end, none of them are that. Yeah, like Batman or Robin thought he needed to be Batman. When Batman didn't even want him to be Batman. No, and Superboy thought he needed to be Superman. And he mm -hmm. tried so hard. He tried, but that was unattainable for him. He had to be the version of himself. And Megan thought she needed to be, hello, Megan. <laughs> right, exactly. And she actually needed to be the real version of Megan. Right, exactly. But herself. Uh, and even Wally thought he had to be something else, like proving himself in different ways because of an inadequacy he had in his own powers, mm -hmm. which was slower than impulse, slower than Barry. Like he had to, he seemed, he seems happy and, and happy to be, you know, a hero and, and everything that he is in that. But he has to almost compensate for that insecurity with comedy mm -hmm. until he got older and realized that he didn't have to do that. And he was worthy. He was worthwhile all on his own. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's what we all go through. Right. This idea of there's a there's a Zen Cohen, this idea of when you first start studying Zen, before you start studying Zen, a mountain is a mountain and a river is a river. When you start studying it, a mountain is no longer a mountain and a river is no longer a river. When you have when you have approached mastery of Zen, a mountain once again becomes a mountain and a river once again becomes a river. Right. It's this idea that you start off with this idea of what you think something is, meaning yourself. Yes. You have to almost destroy all that so that you can break the barriers down that are preventing you from actually becoming the person that you are. Like I'm the same core person I was when I was a kid. I just I am able to express what that is way easier now and find my place to be the best me I can be in a way mm -hmm. that I couldn't do when I was younger. But I don't feel like I've changed that much. I feel like I've only just gotten out of my own way more. Because it's about, it's about the journey and you finding your own path. And yes. it's your journey and it's your experiences. And that's what, right. that's what we have to keep in mind when, when watching Young Justice you know, through our own eyes, our very adult eyes, Rich, is right. that... Thank you for that. This, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll speak to myself. My very adult eyes view this, but the, that's only one half of, the, half of the story. The other part of the story and storytelling is the person that is experiencing it because they bring their own life to that, to that table, to the to the TV, to their iPad, however they happen to be watching it in that moment. Yeah. Um, Young Justice, or, you know, if we were to go back to mythology, this was all an oral tradition, you know, people telling stories around a fire or in in the hearths and homes of of these people who were growing up. And this was the entertainment of their time, right? right? This is how they transitioned their stories, but also how they entertained. And much like, much like this, the person listening, experiencing it, brings the lens by which it is interpreted. Yeah. And, and this is the thing like, that was so fascinating to me, talking to Emily. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, I talked about I was 14 reading you know, Dick Grayson deciding to become Nightwing and how that mattered to me. 
right? And that was important mm-hmm. for me at the time, back in 1984. Well, Emily had a very similar but very different experience in the fact that she was basically Dick's age in Young Justice mm-hmm. and was thinking, oh, I'm going to get this story of him at every year as he grows up. I'm going to grow up another year and I'm going to get to experience these things with him. And then that was pulled out from under her because there was a five-year jump and now he's suddenly an adult. And she got she missed all of the stuff that she had wanted to see and experience and share with him. I, I, I mean, I, I have a parallel to that in a way. I, I started reading a series called The Belgariad when I was younger. Um, oh, yeah. I love The Belgariad. And my dad gave it to me because at the time, I was just a little bit older than um, Garion, who's the character Garion, in the book, yeah. right? So he starts off at about eight or, or so. I think I was 11 when I started looking at it. And so as I was reading them slowly uh, and they were coming out, Garion ages from, you know, around 10 until his 20s and in his early 20s. And I read through the Belgariad and the Malorian. And I remember where I was when I finished. I'm tearing up when I finished that story because I basically grew up with this kid. He was like a friend Mm -hmm. because he got to be my age at 23, early 20s when I finished it sitting on a park bench in at UC Santa Cruz finishing the series and feeling like I was saying goodbye to old friends. You know, like I got to experience that thing. And now I think about Emily in this five year jump and I understand why she's so upset about it because Mm -hmm. she didn't get to have that experience of of sharing that story as aging up. And that and I look back on it and go like, oh, the five year jump was brilliant. It was great. You can tell all these other stories and you can bring these new characters in and you have the five years to explore later. And what about what happened? We don't know any of the stories before the first season either. And Dick's been a in action for four years before that even started. So why aren't people wound up about that? Like, but I'm looking at it from a completely different lens than Emily is mm-hmm. and an understandable lens that she has. And this and I mean, that actually makes me think like I've I've always struggled with how people were so upset about the 30 year jump with between the original trilogy and the sequel trilogy. And, mm. you know, people were really upset because really? they they loved the stories of Luke Skywalker and they wanted to see what had happened to him. And they didn't understand how he ended up becoming such an embittered old man. <laughs> oh, and see, yeah, I mean. Well, here's the other here's here's another aspect of these myth mythologies, right? Like you're mm-hmm. saying, this interpretation of the lens. And I think one of the things that the Last Jedi did, and why it was so, I think, dividing in the community for a lot of different reasons, is everybody was looking at it through a bunch of different lenses. Yeah, and like there were things that. I understood that I thought was trying to be told by the story that I enjoyed. And then there were things that I thought were terrible, but I haven't found anybody who believes the exact same handful of things they loved and handful of things they didn't like that I do. So like, I'm like, yeah, Porgs. Yeah, fine. I'm fine with them. Right. Luke being an embittered old man. I'm in. I get it. I totally get it. You don't have to explain any of that to me. It didn't even occur to me that that was a problem. Right. That wasn't any of my issue necessarily. Right. But there were other parts of it that I didn't like that other people did. And so mm-hmm. these myths can be interpreted like you were just exactly like you were saying, I guess I'm coming around to your point like yeah. from how it's viewed and who's viewing it. And it's interesting to me that a movie like The Last Jedi uh, or the live action DC comics films or anything like that, there are people who love them and people who don't. And they have different filters that are approaching them. Mm hmm. But there are other movies which are generally accepted as everybody being generally on the same page, right? Like, people don't like uh, the new Avengers movie. There are people who are like, eh, it's okay. I didn't, wasn't really that thrilled by it. There are people picking holes in it. But generally, people are really, really enjoying it. And I find this interesting from a mythological perspective of how and why there are differences between that from a storytelling perspective and what we can learn or not learn. I mean, some people would say that Marvel movies have a, they're formulaic. They're meant to evoke a certain level of emotion in a particular way. Mm -hmm. And though I agree with that in some ways, I look personally, I look at that as like, yeah, but that's what works to tell a story. And if you go too far off from that, you're going to get farther away from maybe telling, telling the story you wanted to tell. I'm not sure how to phrase it. A friend of mine describes Marvel movies as steak. (laughs) Steak. Like, I can always eat a steak. <laughs> Interesting. 
<laughs> right? So, sure. so it's it's different versions of how you cook the steak. Maybe it's a different cut. Maybe it's a different piece. But for the most part, yeah, you ask me if I want a steak, I'll I'll say yeah. <laughs> I guess that makes sense. But right? then one of the movies that I that I think about, it's a movie that matters so much to me that almost nobody else has either ever seen or cares about. Is called The Big Blue, and mm-hmm. it's a movie about free divers that was done. Uh, I want to say back in the 80s. Um, mm-hmm. And it has this really, particularly, it has this really, um, I guess, self-interpretive ending. <laughs> and I absolutely love that movie. And people just don't like it or they don't get it. It doesn't connect with them. And so the movie follows a lot of those kind of hero, hero's journey ideas in many ways of building story. But I think skews too far away from things that people understand so it's going to appeal to a much smaller audience. Mm. And how these mythologies tie into, the, like this idea of Medea you're talking about, like it seems to perfectly apply to McGann. Yeah. But was that an accident? Or was that this core almost kind of monomyth parallel? Because the, the monomyth is tricky because it was developed by Joseph Campbell and some people agree with him and some people don't. And there's right. now these newer theories about heroine journeys and that they focus more on the self change and that heroes and heroines can go through the heroine's journey. And, you know, like it's, it's complicated, right? Because people are kind of re-examining Campbell's work through a different lens of, of the modern view, because what we know about ourselves as humans changes over time as we're able to reflect back and understand these things more. Yeah. McGann could be this archetype as you said, of this woman who kind of gives up her her own family, which is actually quite a common archetype for Greek mythology. I I actually think that a better archetype for a woman going through a change in mythology is Psyche, who um, ends up getting married to Cupid, and it's it's really cool, and they go to the underworld and all sorts right. of amazing stuff. But you know. Yeah, it could be, or it could just be that we're plugged into the few narrative structures that a work with superheroes. What is yeah. really important? What drives that character to, you know, do extraordinary things? Because when you're dealing with heroes or you're dealing with demigods, you have to push them even more to the extreme to make those character choices. And that's always what it's about because fundamentally adolescence myth these decision making is about becoming and about figuring out who you are on the inside and who that hero is yeah uh long pause i didn't just lose the audio i'm thinking (laughs) sorry about all of this why are you apologizing for making me think that's not a thing (laughs) Why do you think I started this podcast? I know. This is good. Okay. Okay. So one last thing. I, so let's just bring this back. You mm-hmm. just mentioned the underworld. So I need to call you back yeah. on something that you had mentioned earlier. Cadmus. About Cadmus and the underworld. Let's, let's, let's end it on Cadmus and the underworld, maybe. We'll see if we end. Yeah. But so you were going to say something about Cadmus in the underworld and Superboy being on 52 levels below the earth. Yes. Uh, I mean, the parallels are there. They have uh, these hell-like creatures uh, that live in the underworld. Okay, It looks much like the underworld. They have to pass through several layers to get to where where Superboy is. Right. And he is almost like a lost soul that they are bringing back from the underworld (gasps) to... And he's glowing in that solar suit like a soul being lost in... Yes. Yes. There's so many parallels (laughs) there. And I would... I would love to ask if these were on purpose ever. So if you ever get a chance to do that, but Cadmus is self being underground and this like it's because because the underworld in in Greek mythology is not is not like it's not the Judeo Christian underworld. Yeah, I mean, that's Tartarus. So Tartarus is like this this actual hell, this torment, this place where you are suffering the underworld, which is you know, ruled by Hades, 
is not. It is like a purgatory. It is a place where souls just go to exist until the end of time. It is <laughs> It is wow. this place of being. And several myths focus on either going to to the underworld for power, like Psyche ends up having to go and speak with the queen of the underworld and bring back her beauty because Venus has lost her beauty and she needs beauty to, to revive re, 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 that. You know, several people go to the underworld, uh, you know, tricking the guard dog. Right. <laughs> right, tricking Cerberus. Or they end up having to bring souls back. Right. And... I think that Superboy, in a way, is a uh, lost soul that is brought back from the dead. I The purgatory thing you brought up fascinates me because that's basically what he was in. He's mm-hmm. just existing down there. Existing. I love the way and you phrase that. Yeah, all those, other, all those other creatures that are in those tubes are very purgatory-esque like you get this feeling of oh, of yeah. the matrix and how they're plugged into the to the matrix and it's just sort of like existing it's not actually um life right it's not above ground it's this mockery of life almost yeah the way that it's set up it doesn't allow growth or change until no they free to an extent free the yeah which I, I really like that parallel as well so i love that young justice not only has the earth you know where where the demigods rule in a way, but you also have Olympus and you also have the underworld. <laughs> I think I think that's where we're going to wrap it up. I'm, I suspect this is going to be a two-parter. <laughs> I, I'm still, pro- I'm going to be processing all day. Thanks so much for spending time with us in the Watchtower, Mary Claire. Where can people find you uh, here on Earth Prime if they want to uh, pick your brain about these parallels? Well, I am available at WT Force Show for anything related to Star Wars. So that's the Twitter for Star Wars, the What the Force Show. Um, you can find my personal Twitter at, at Marie C. Gould. You can reach out to me on either of those. I love talking about parallels. If I got anything wrong, it's because I Rich makes me nervous. So <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm very intimidating. Uh, very. No, he's, you were a wonderful guest or sorry, wonderful host. I'm a pretty good guest too. Well, you can, you're welcome to come on to my show and talk about Star Wars. <laughs> Let's do it. I still need to talk about aquatic species in Star Wars. We haven't quite gotten around to that on, uh, on any of the other Star Wars shows I've been on. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Aquatic species are really cool. Kid Fisto, best Jedi ever. A best Jedi. <laughs> he was the best dueling Jedi. I think that that ended up being called out. Oh, I will um, go a deep dive on why Kit Fisto is the best Jedi. Don't you worry. <laughs> and I'm also a player on the curated actual play D&D live podcast, Tavern Tales, which is available every Wednesday. What the Force is available every Monday. So lots of me if you want to listen to me talk. I'm also directing a play upcoming in September uh, called Unnecessary Force or Our Unnecessary Farce, which is in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. If you want to come and see my directorial debut. Nice. I love it. All right. And thanks to everyone else for sharing some time with us. You can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on the yjfiles.tumblr.com, on our website, crashingthemode.com, our email address, whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. And also now on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. If you enjoy our show, please consider sharing it with a friend. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have to dig a little harder to find those. And even though Season 3 has been officially announced, please continue to spread the word to friends and family about the series. Hashtag buy YJ Comics on Comixology and get yourself up to speed for the season three premiere. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. 
As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.